So welcome back to part two of lecture 20 for math, 21 for math 2R03. We're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about a special type of uh, operator. And this is going to be a nilpotent operator. So an operator is a nilpotent operator if when you raise n to the power of zero, uh, to the power of L, you get the zero operator for some integer L. And let me give you kind of an example that comes more from calculus, and, you, uh, and this may be a little bit more familiar to you. If we take the vector space of all polynomials of degree two or less, the differential operator D is nilpotent, okay? So in fact, what we know is that D cubed is equal to zero. So what this is really saying is that if you take a polynomial of degree two or, or less, and you take its derivative three times, you'll end up with zero. So that's one way to think about what this is doing here. So here, let, let's be a little bit more explicit. Let's say I take any polynomial of degree two, so a naught plus a1x plus a2x squared. Then when I take the derivative of this, I get a1 plus 2a2x. If I take the square, uh, apply d twice, that's the same thing as applying the derivative of this to this function, which gives me 2a2. And then if I apply the differential operator three times the p, which is the same thing as applying the differential operator to the constant two times a2, I get zero. So the differential operator is kind of a good example to think of, of, of an example of an operator that is nilpotent. Okay. And one nice thing is we know that if L is nilpotent, then N raised to the power of the dimension of V is equal to zero. Okay, so if we go back to the definition, it just says that some power of N gives you the gives you the zero operator. It gives you no indication about the L, but the, as the next theorem says is, you know when you get at least to the dimension of V, then it will actually be equal to zero. So the proof actually isn't that hard. So what does it mean for n to the l equals to zero? Well, that means that the, the null space of this, uh, of n to the n l is equal to zero, uh, v, right? Because this means that everything gets sent to zero. But this gives us only one direction, okay? So I wanna point out this is only one direction. This implies then that um, the generalized eigenspace of zero is equal to V, which is the same thing as saying that the null space of, oh, sorry, I should say it like this, which is equal to the null space of N to the d dimension of V is equal to V. Okay. Because the generalized uh, eigenspace of zero, right, is the null space of this particular operator. And if this space is equal to V, that implies that this space is also equal to V, okay? Okay, um, so the, what we're gonna spend the, kind of the rest of this part is actually proving another theorem that's a little bit more complicated, but we'll do a nice example in the next two parts. So when you have a nilpotent operator, there's actually a choice of bases of the vector space V so that the matrix associated with that nilpotent operator is an upper triangular matrix, but with the property of all zeros down the diagonal, zeros on the left-hand side, and some non-zero elements on the, right hand, uh, on the upper right, okay? And so let's quickly walk through the proof about why this is true. Now, we have this chain of um, inclusions, and this follows from the last lecture, right? So if you have the zero subspace, it's in the null space of n, which is in the null space of n squared, and so on. And this last equality comes from the fact that n is nilpotent, okay? So you kind of have this growing chain of subspaces that grow, uh, fills up all the, the spe vector space V. And now what we can do is say, well, let u11, u12 up to u1n1 be a basis of the null space n. 
Okay, so these guys are kind of a, a basis for this part. But now, these vectors here, because they're in here, and this is inside of here, we can now extend this collection to a basis for the next subspace, right? So we can, and I'll use different colors here, right? So you take U11 up to UN1, and now you can add some new vectors. Oh, and let me make sure I keep my notation right. And then I can add a new batch of vectors, U2, 1, up to U2, N2, which are going to be kind of the basis for N squared, right? So here we have, this is the basis for N. And then what we're doing here is this is the basis of the null space of N squared. And what we want to do now is keep doing this, right? So we're going to keep extending this uh, piece by piece so that we get a basis for all of our vector space, right? So we keep repeating. And um, so at the end, we would have U, let me make sure I make my um, L. Okay, make sure I got all our indexes right. So we have U L one up to U L N one and L. And what we have here is this is a basis for the null n. These the red guys then are a basis for null n squared. And then everything here, oops, didn't want it to clean it up there. I want it this is now everything is a basis for the vector space V. Right. And as I as I just wrote here, right, this gives us a basis for our vector space V since we knew know that the null space of N to the L is equal to V because we have a, a null potent operator. And now this basis right here we claim is the desired basis. Because it, we'll look at maybe just going from red to uh, red to green and green down, right? If I t apply n to any of the green ones, because these are a basis for null n, they all get sent to zero. If I apply the uh, operator n to any of the red ones, it gets bumped down to the green ones. Because if I do it one more time, I get sent to a zero. If I I don't have a different color here, but if I applied it to any of the basis elements for the n cubed, it would give me an element in terms of the reds and the greens. Okay, So what we have is that this is the desired basis, since when we apply the nil potent operator to the basis elements coming from uh, n to the j, this belongs in the null space of n to the j minus 1. Right? And so that means that we can rewrite the element as C11 U11 up to C1N1 U1N1, and then all the way up to, there's a lot of notation here, CJ1 uh, UJ minus 1, 1 up to C. Sorry, there's too much notation here, and I even got lost into it. Let me clean that up. So we have C, J, uh, minus 1, 1, and then I have, I might as well keep the notation the same. So let's try it one more time. C, 1, J, minus 1. U, uh, I will get this right eventually. So J, minus 1, 1, U, J, minus 1, 1, up to C, j minus 1 and j minus 1, u, uh, j minus 1 and j minus 1. Okay, so it's, it's a little a little complicated to see what, what's happening here, but this element here is now in terms of the basis for null uh, n up to null and j minus one. Okay, so anything that was uh, a basis element of n to the j gets written in terms of the basis elements of smaller ones. And what you see then is that all the non uh, all the non-zero elements have to be above the main diagonal 
above the main diagonal in m to the n, right? So if you want to see kind of a little bit more uh, pictorially what I mean by this, right? So if we're looking at mn and you're looking at the particular element u, j, uh, k, which is corresponding to this column, where does it get sent? Okay, it gets sent in terms of the basis elements right here. Uh, it gets sent to u1 up to uj minus one and j minus one. So you have potentially non-zero things here, but then you have all zero things down here. And ujk is way down here. So it's not to scale, but this is where the diagonal should have been. Okay, so that's kind of why you end up with this upper triangular matrix where all the diagonal entries are zero. So hopefully this picture kind of helped. Uh, and uh, the proof is maybe a little complicated, but I'm going to work out some time, spend some time working out an example in detail in the next part.